So this talk is going to be about software-defined networking and especially how software-defined networking is embedded into CloudStack. So a li little bit a bit about me for those of you who are new to me being presenting here. I was here early this morning, but there's some people who, who don't know me yet. So I'm a part of the uh, of the Apache Cl Software uh, CloudStack project. Actually, I'm uh, recently elected as VP. So I actually have a title now on my name. It's it's pretty good. I have a day job who pays for all my uh, activities on CloudStack at the uh, Schubert Phyllis. Uh, I've been doing a little bit of work on the Open Daylight project, uh, actually quite a few other projects as well. And if I have some free time and not sitting behind a compiler, I actually do play a lot of games. So if you want to reach out to me, there's a couple of contact details. And yeah, there's obviously always a lot more. So interesting stuff. Software defined networking. So first of all, Raise your hands. Who here knows about software-defined networking? And who here would be capable of explaining software-defined networking in like one sentence? Yeah, I see a lot less hands now. And that was actually my problem. When I got involved with software-defined networking, the first thing I did was, what the hell is software-defined networking? And this is actually one of the things I found. It's a definition by the uh, Open Networking Foundation. And they wrote down what they thought was software-defined networking. And th that's where I started. And then I started to get into the community, get into people, talk to a lot of people about software-defined networking. And that's when I found out that no one has actually been able to pinpoint it. I like this definition, but it's, it's nowhere near correct. I mean, software-defined networking, it's more like it, it's an idea. It, it's a dream. It's, yeah, it's something we all work towards in, uh, in the software-defined networking industry, but nobody has a really clear goal about where, we, yeah, where it needs to go, what it is and how, how it actually works. So what I'm going to do today is talk about software-defined networking in CloudStack, and especially it's how I think software-defined networking uh, works. Uh, so it's not going to be a completely comprehensive talk about everything there is to talk about software-defined networking, but mainly as it is in CloudStack, and well, yeah, what I think is the most useful for a cloud management system. So who in this audience is familiar with Apache CloudStack? I got a few hands, that's good. So allow me to give you a few, yeah, a quick rundown of networking in Apache CloudStack. So knowing that Apache CloudStack is a cloud management system, cloud operating system, it's designed to support clouds to orchestrate uh, resources like compute, like networking, like storage. Uh, the way it orchestrates networking is that it has a, a set of particular models of which where an administrator can choose to build his cloud upon. So for a discussion about software-defined networking, it's pretty yeah, uh, um, essential to understand the basic types of networking that we have in Apache CloudStack. So there's two really fundamental ways of doing networking in CloudStack. The first one is what we call basic networking. And basic networking uses a single flat layer tree network and provides a, a measure of security or tenant segregation using security groups. And security groups mean that we can define a f couple of VMs of being in a, in a group and then allowing them selective access to other resources, for example, the internet or another machine. And we do that by providing stuff like bridge firewalls or uh, layer tree firewalls, etc. But the main point here, it's a, it's a single flat network and is usually connected to the outside network using an external router. And in most deployments, all your IP addresses will be actual routable internet IP addresses. So there's pretty much a direct connection to the internet and the segregation is completely on layer three. Advanced networking is, for the purpose of software-defined networking, a more interesting way of working. Advanced networking uh, dictates that every tenant or e every network is separated using uh, a single layer two broadcast domain. That means that every user or every network really gets its own separate network. This network is connected to the internet using some kind of routing capability, which can be the built-in virtual router uh, of CloudStack, which is a, a special VM uh, designed to provide networking services, or it can be any other type of hardware that we can support at the moment, like uh, uh, Netscalers or Palo Alto firewalls. But the main point here is that the network is a separated uh, uh, layer two broadcast domain. And this makes it really interesting from a point of view where we can use software-defined networking because that's one of the points where we can actually yeah, 
provide services. We can provide, with software-defined networking, we can provide isolated layer two networks. But even though we can provide it, why would we actually want to? So if you look at the typical cloud type of deployment uh, at the moment without software-defined networking, this is pretty much what we're looking at. We have a cloud management system, CloudStack. We have a number of hypervisors. We probably also have some storage. And it's all provisioned. It's all done automatically. I mean, we have uh, tools like uh, Libvirt, uh, Xapi, etc. So we can manage hypervisors. We have several protocols, NFS, Swift, S3, which we can use to orchestrate storage. So we have pretty much a comprehensive system of which we can automate two out of three of the main points that we need to orchestrate as a cloud management system. The only thing lacking is network support. And if you look how network support is currently done, it's usually a guy like this. <laughs> He's sitting in the data center. He has a laptop, usually with a USB to serial console and a cable, and he plugs it into the switch. If he's lucky, he actually fixed his connection already. So he, he's sitting in his office. But it, at the end of the day, he is using a, a console session to configure his network. So we've invested a lot of effort in getting hypervisors orchestrated. We've spent a lot of effort in getting all your storage orchestrated. And then when, yeah, when we need a network, we're going to leave it to the, yeah, to the Guardian Data Center. So one of the things that software-defined networking is actually able to provide us, or one of the ideas behind software-defined networking, is that we can actually have a system where the network is part of the orchestration cycle. And how do we do this? The key point here is that we say we, the network needs an API. And it can be as simple as having a single switch with a single switch API, or it can be as complex as having a real uh, software-defined networking controller out there that actually yeah, takes care of a lot of the intricacies of the, of the network itself and deals with a lot of issues that we have in the network. And the main point of having such a system is that we can actually relax and make sure that, yeah, in, in our case, CloudStack actually deals with all the difficult stuff in the network. Uh, so a, a couple of core concepts about software-defined networking. And yeah, this is where it gets a little bit about your personal opinion about so, what software-defined networking actually is. But for me, one of the really important parts of software-defined networking is the fact that we create abstractions. I mean, I'm working on a cloud management system. I'm working on a cloud uh, orchestration system, so I want to orchestrate stuff. Um, but still, I'm not a networking expert. Or, no, okay, maybe actually I am, but for the sake of purposes, I'm not. So I don't want to know too much about the intricacies of setting up a data center network, though I still want to orchestrate it. And by using an abstraction layer, I can probably t I want to be able to tell the abstraction layer, like, okay, I want a network, I want it to be, I want it to have certain features, and I want to be able to connect virtual machines to that particular network. I don't want to have to deal with a lot of the low-level stuff, like setting up spanning tree, uh, configuring ports, uh, balancing, bonding, uh, switch channels, etc. Uh, leave that to the people actually know how to do this stuff. So if we have a software-defined networking controller, it, it usually means that we also have an abstraction layer which says, okay, you tell me what to do, and I will tell you how to do it. In a sense, a good software-defined networking controller functions much like a cloud management system or cloud uh, orchestration system. It orchestrates network resources. And by putting it in between a complete cloud orchestration system, it means that we can offload part of our orchestration to such a device. The most important part here is that it has an API. A software-defined networking controller that doesn't have an API is a pretty useless thing. I mean, it's designed to work in such a way that we can tell it what to do. And it doesn't provide me a UI, but it provides me with an API. And with an API, I can use it from a cloud management system. One of the things you often hear when you talk about software-defined networking is a decoupling of the data plane and the control plane. Actually, this is one of the basic premises where the whole software-defined networking movement actually started. I mean, we can talk about uh, abstractions, we can talk about Norbind APIs, but actually the fact that we decoupled the control plane from the data plane was the single fact that actually triggered the entire revolution. So what is a, a data plane and what's the control plane? If you look at a typical switch, and then for the sake of argument, we take a physical switch with a lot of ports in it, like a 24-port Cisco switch or something, 
it actually has two ways of working, or actually it has two major components that we can identify. So first of all is the data plane. The data plane is a very simple feature. It's usually built in silicon, in ASICs, and its simple pr single purpose is receive a packet and send it out on any other port. I mean, it's that simple. That's the basic function of a switch. Get a packet, see where you, where you want it to go, preferably not the port you received it on, but any other port, or if you're a more intelligent switch, you're only going to send it out on ports where you actually know that this MAC particular MAC address lives. But the basic setup is really simple. Get a packet, get it out there again. The control plane is the guy with the intelligence. I mean, that's the guy who's doing the planning of the routing. That's the guy who knows, OK, well, even though we have a 24-port switch, I'm going to put ports 1 to 8 in VLAN X and 9 to 10 or 9 to something in the other VLAN. So it's, a, it's the control plane that actually knows how to make intelligent decisions for the switch. And the control plane then tells the data plane, OK, this is what you need to do if you, if you get a packet on this port. If you get a packet on port 8, I want you to only send it out on port 1 to 7. If we decouple the control plane, by decoupling it, we mean we're going to take it out. So basically, we're going to put a switch in the network, and we're going to make it respond to outside stimuli. So we're just going to put a data plane, a physical data plane somewhere in the data center, and we're going to move the control plane to a controller. This gives us a single big advantage that not only can we control a single switch, because if you have the, this hardware switch, you have a control plane and a data plane which are tightly coupled in the same device. So you can only control it on that particular device, and its entire world consists of the device and any direct connections to that device. But if we take the control plane and we move it to a central controller, and we do it for not only that particular switch, but we do it for every switch in our network, every switch in our data center, we suddenly get a central point where we have the entire network controllable from a single spot. That means that we can not only control a single switch where we have to think about how is my relation to the other switches, but we can start thinking about the network as a whole. So suddenly we have an entire network that we can control from a single point and telling it to behave as a complete entity instead of a combination of, uh, uh, yeah, of loosely coupled switches. If we have that feature, if we have suddenly we have a, a, a network that we can completely control from, uh, let's say, software, um, we're still not at a point where it's going to be really usable for any cloud orchestration system. So we, we can obviously now control a data center. We can control the entire packet flow. But there's one other thing that's making it really interesting to actually use uh, in a cloud orchestration system. And that's what we call overlay networking. And that's the basic point of network virtualization. With overlay networking, we're going to take it one step further. So we have this switch that we can now control. And you know, we've, for now, we've been talking about hardware switches. But actually, a hypervisor, when we create a virtual machine on a hypervisor, we connect the network interface card of the virtual machine we are creating also to a switch. But this switch is not a physical switch. It's a, it's a software switch. And most commonly, it's the OpenV switch at the moment. If we want to do communication between virtual machines that are living on the same hypervisor, it's pretty easy. They communicate using an, a regular switch. But of course, we are a cloud, and we want to scale, so we have multiple hypervisors. So suddenly, we have the interesting problem that we have a, a virtual switch running in a hypervisor, which is probably connected to a real physical switch in the data center. But we actually want to enable communication between the switch uh, that we have in hypervisor A and the switch you have in hypervisor B. Traditionally, we would do that using something like VLAN. So we just we create a VLAN on the, on, the, uh, on the virtual switch. We create the same, the same VLAN on the physical switch. And then suddenly we have a VLAN that we can span across all things. But if you think about it, why not just make those two switches communicate directly and don't care about the underlying data center infrastructure? And that's the basic idea behind software virtualization. So we have a virtual switch in a hypervisor. We have a virtual switch in another hypervisor. And we're going to patch them together directly. And by patching, yeah, we can't use cables since it's all virtual. So we're using the old and proven tunnel technology. So what we have then is that we have a, a data center infrastructure, which is probably providing me with some kind of layer 3 networking, uh, very simple. 
And on top of that, we have virtual switches living in each of the hypervisors, and those virtual switches are connected together using tunnels. Suddenly, we have created a system where we have an underlay network, which is my data center network, and an overlay network, which is the network that we have between the virtual switches. Meaning that we can have completely isolated layer two broadcast domains running on top of a, of a network. And from that point onward, we don't care actually about that underlay network anymore because we can now, we have a virtual layer two broadcast domain. And they function completely like real virtual, uh, like real broadcast domains. I mean, they do ARP, they do everything, so it's real Ethernet that's going on there. But it's completely separated from the data center infrastructure, providing us with a number of, uh, yeah, number of additional capabilities that we didn't have before, because it, it doesn't affect our physical switches. So our physical switches don't need that much configuration anymore. I can run a 700 network cloud infrastructure over a single flat VLAN. And we have it completely in software control, because now we have uh, virtual switches, which are self-controlled. We have uh, hypervisors, which are self software controlled. And if we're lucky, we can, we're going to connect all those virtual switches to a software-defined networking controller, having also central control over the entire virtual fabric. So that's software-defined networking. The next question, obviously, where is it in CloudStack? For those of you who've seen this interface, this is one of the main interfaces on how to configure CloudStack. This is all the things you can add to CloudStack. And it's not in here. And there's a very good reason why we didn't put it in here. Um, we, th we envision that software-defined networking, even though it is special and it is a buzzword at the moment, it should not be something special. It, it is just networking. Even though it does very advanced tricks and we can do a lot of yeah, funky features using software-defined networking, it isn't really something that should be special. Uh, we shouldn't add it in any special way. No, the point here is that we want software-defined networking to really be part of the core of CloudStack. That means that we don't need to list it here. You don't need to add it to CloudStack. It's not a plugin you have to get somewhere and enable. It, it, it's there. Every CloudStack installation at the moment that you have out there is capable of using software-defined networking. Or actually, it's using networking. And software-defined networking is no different from uh, the tra traditional type of networking we had in CloudStack. And it's completely integrated with the offering model we have in CloudStack. So one of the points of CloudStack is that we want to give the operator a, and the users a lot of choices about how he provides resources or which resources he wants to provide. So as part of the offering system, you can now say, I want this particular network offering to use virtual networking, or I, was I want this particular network offering to use traditional VLANs. Giving the giving the administrator, in the end, the flexibility to say, I wanted to go left or I wanted to go right. But the point is, it's, it's built in the core of CloudStack, so there's no special features required. To prove the point, this is one of the Thunder technologies that we currently use. It's available for any hypervisor that's currently using Open vSwitch, which are uh, Accent Center and KVM. And it allows you to use either the GRE or the VXLAN tunnel protocol. In this case, even though it, it is considered software-defined networking, we're not using a centralized controller. CloudStack is the controller. So CloudStack knows that if it provisions a virtual machine for a particular tenant on a hypervisor, and it provisions the next virtual machine for that particular tenant on another hypervisor, it needs to create a tunnel between the two hypervisors to make sure that there's communication between, uh, between the virtual machines. And this is completely built in. It's controlled by CloudStack, and it's supports uh, the GRE protocol and the VXLAN protocol. And yeah, if there's more protocols like NVGRE coming up in the market uh, soon, we will probably start supporting this as well. The nice example, the, the nice thing about this solution is that it's actually, yeah, the moment you download and install CloudStack, this is already there. It's a matter of just enabling uh, it in the correct service offering, and you can use this type of software for networking right away. The next one is one of the examples we have. This is the VMware NSX, or at the time when we added this feature, it was called Nasira NVP. It's one of the first uh, uh, software-defined networking systems out there for commercial use, and, and 
it's also for CloudStack the first one that works with an external controller. So we had GRE support for quite some time, and this was actually a pretty new feature where we added uh, VMware NSX, or New Zero MVP at the time. Uh, and this is the first one where we had to add support for an external controller. The interesting part of this implementation was that we had to really rethink a lot of core features inside CloudStack. Up to that point, everything was based around VLANs with some additional hacking uh, uh, going on to make sure that we could support the GRE tunnels when we wanted to. With this implementation, we actually changed a lot in the core of the networking features of CloudStack so that we not only were dependent on, on VLANs in a lot of places, but we were actually having a flexible system where we could support any kind of broadcast domain, be it VLANs, be it different types of software for networking vendors or tunneling systems. And this particular solution had, yeah, at the time, two really big advantages. For one, it uses the SDT protocol. Well, the protocol itself is probably something that ought to be shot. Uh, it had some very interesting possibilities. For example, most of you who've worked with tunnel technologies know that one of the big disadvantages of tunnel technologies is that we lose the efficiency or lose the added benefit of TCP offloading. If you have a 10 gig networking card and it has TCP offloading, do you think it's gonna work if you have a GRE tunnel? No, it's called TCP offloading for a reason because it's offload TCP. That's, I think, the same what the guys of, uh, of Nasera thought at the time. So they said, well, then we're gonna send our tunnel traffic over TCP. But to make it a little bit more efficient, we're gonna strip the whole SYNX stuff out of it. We're gonna strip the retransmits out of it. We're gonna strip the whole reset, fin, whatever bit out of it. And we're gonna call it STT. So basically we're left with a UDP protocol that uses a TCP header. Not too nice, but it actually allows you a lot of benefit because you can really get up to nine gig of traffic on a 10 gig ethernet card between two virtual machines. The other interesting part of this solution is that they had a gateway. And a gateway is, especially for enterprise or for people who have legacy infrastructures, a really important feature. Not everybody is completely cloud-based. Not everybody is suddenly so big and is gonna ditch his old legacy infrastructure. So now we have this fantastic new technology which allows us to build virtual networks, but there's still a mainframe in the data center that you need to connect. With a gateway, in this case, uh, called an on-ramp, off-ramp device, it allows us to actually make connections between a virtual space, a virtual network, which runs in our cloud infrastructure, or in a cloud infrastructure, and a physical VLAN or a physical host running on some other network at the time really a special uh, type of solution. One of the other providers I would like to mention is uh, the Midakura solution, Midakura Midanet. They were, I think, the, they were the second, uh, after Nasir MVP, they were the second one added, uh, who added support to CloudStack. Interesting for a number of reasons. Uh, they were the first vendor for us to actually jump on the SDM bandwagon in CloudStack, and they came to us saying, hey, we want to add uh, our support to CloudStack. So that was really, uh, really something new. And for us, also an indication that we probably did a good thing in creating a clear interface and a clear way of integrating software for networking in CloudStack. And they went a step beyond what we did with the other software for networking vendors. So, so, so far, we've been really focused on getting a layer two broadcast domain. So basically, we just, yeah, we took away the old VLANs, we replaced it with a software defined networking construct, but everything else was relatively unchanged. Mirakura, they took it a step further and they said, well, you have this complete network offering model, you have providers, so why don't we add some of our additional features to CloudStack as well? So, for example, one of the things that you need to do in a network is DHCP. If you boot a virtual machine, you want to give it an IP address, and this IP address is provisioned using CloudStack. In most networks, we use the virtual router to provide DSCP addresses. With Mitakura, we can actually use the Mitakura system to provide these IP addresses. So instead of using a virtual router, we can use the Mitakura solution. And they've implemented some of the other features by now, like firewalling or static NAT and port forwarding. So they've taken it one step further and said we can not only do layer two integration, but we can also do some advanced layer three functions. This is an overview about what we currently have in, in Apache CloudStack. And lucky for me, every time I can give this presentation, every time I can add a couple of names to the slide. 
So at the moment, we have, I think, most of the big names in the industry working with, uh, working with CloudStack uh, at the moment. So we have the, uh, the uh, VMware NSX, uh, the Medicare Medonet, but, and recently we had support for Juniper Open Contrail. And we have some support for Open Daylight. Open Daylight is a little bit of a strange uh, controller here where all the other vendors are really purpose-built network, vir network virtualization solutions like uh, the VMware NSX or the um, uh, BDNet solution. Open Daylight is more like a generic uh, controller that can do a lot of stuff. It is an SDN controller, but it takes really SDN as the most broadest form they can have. So it doesn't only concern itself with virtual networking, but it does uh, real switch management, uh, open flow management, et cetera, et cetera. So having support for open daylight is hopefully enabling us to provide more advanced networking capabilities in the future. If they progress with their project, we can have yeah, a bigger benefit from their uh, ability to support stuff. And one of the newest vendors we're currently working with is Nuage Networks. It's uh, the Alcatel Lucent solution. And they, yeah, they're currently working on, uh, uh, on support for Apache Cloud Stack. So hopefully we, uh, yeah, we will get it in uh, pretty soon. So let's see about a little bit about the, uh, the technical intricacies of uh, getting support for software-defined networking into CloudStack. So this is actually a pretty old picture by now because, yeah, as you know, in open source world, everything changes overnight. But this is the, the, the core about how the internals of CloudStack work. So we have the entire API, which is outside. We have the orchestration logic, uh, which yeah, decides how certain business rules uh, should be enforced. We have the CloudStack kernel, and in the kernel we really have the knowledge about the, uh, the detailed handling of um, yeah, hypervisors or storage. So, uh, we have a, a number of adapters, and the adapters connect the, the CloudStack kernel, who knows how to yeah, do particular stuff, to the real southbound interfaces or the, yeah, the APIs of the underlying infrastructure. So this one, the adapters connect to, for example, XAPI or Libvirt or any of the real, uh, uh, the, yeah, the real drivers underneath. And there's an entire plugin infrastructure. And the plugin infrastructure is designed in such a way that, that we can dynamically, or at least with a minimal amount of binding, add plugins to CloudStack. So adding a software-defined networking uh, controller to CloudStack means that we have to yeah, basically do a lot of work. Uh, it is in, in a lot of places we make changes. So the important, of course, we have to add a, a plugin. Uh, a plugin is, in this case, more of a generic framework that allows certain resources to be auto-discovered when we add them to CloudStack. The real working bi bits are the guru and the element. I will come back to them a bit later, but their, their main responsibility is to dealing with, the, uh, with networking events. For example, one networking event can be uh, create a network, and another networking event can be uh, plug a virtual interface into a switch. And we have to make hypervisor adjustments. And that's one of the more interesting things if you really go down into the implementation details is that when you go down to software-defined networking, it's not only about real physical networking anymore. It's not just plugging in a cable. There's actually stuff that you need to do on the hypervisor. There's some black magic involved in making sure that the hypervisor switches, which are software themselves, are also managed. So you, you're getting to a point where it's more interesting uh, um, to talk about the, the combination of how you manage your hypervisors and how you manage your network versus the more traditional siloed uh, system where you can have a yeah, separated hypervisor management, separated network uh, functions, et cetera. So here you really have yeah, to work together with both plugins, with both systems in CloudStack. And that was actually quite some work to get that operating correctly because yeah, there's an interdependency there. And of course you need an, uh, an API wrapper, really the, yeah. Most uh, software-defined networking vendors, they do have an API, but they don't, they're not providing uh, a lot of libraries to, to integrate with. So in most cases, you have to write your own library to access the API. So uh, with some screenshots, I'm going to take you through the, the admin side of uh, software-defined networking integration. So this is assuming we have a plugin and it's working and we want to use it. 
Cloud Stack has a couple of really core concepts in this uh, um, with regards to networking. And one of the most important concepts here is what we call the physical network. Our physical network is the linking pin between what we think is available uh, in the data center that we've built and what Cloud Stack thinks is the reality of how your data center looks. The physical networks hold several very important properties. For example, it holds traffic labels telling you which interface to use on your hypervisor for this, for this particular type of traffic. Another thing it holds is the uh, isolation method. And the isolation method is there to define how traffic should be isolated on this type of network. It used to be a very simple choice, VLAN, VLAN, or VLAN. Uh, so that is one of the points where we really had to do a lot of extension. So we said, okay, now, nowadays, this is where you select the type of uh, technology you would like to use to separate your networks, and especially guest, guest tenant networks. So here you can see an example where we have two physical networks. One of them is for management, and we're using the traditional VLANs to separate the networks, and the other one is for guests, and we're using the STT protocol. And by using the STT protocol, we basically define in this case that we want to use the Nisera MVP plugin for, uh, uh, for software-defined networking, for virtual networking. The next thing is provider. This is really the simple configuration, but quite essential because you need to tell CloudStack where your controller is. In, if you're using the, in, the embedded GRE VXLAN uh, provider, this isn't actually necessary. But if you use any of the additional out, uh, external controllers, you need to configure it. <coughs> the third part is what we call the network offering. And in the network offering, we are going to provide services to our end users. Or actually, we're going to de define a service matrix that we're going to offer to our end users called a network offering. And part of the network offering is the services. So we add a number of services. For example, in this uh, screenshot, there's the static NAT servers, there's the port forwarding servers, and there's the virtual networking servers. And by defining which providers implement this service, we can create the right combination of things. So virtual networking is pretty much key because that indicates that this, n any network provisioned using this network offering will use virtual networking. Um, and the other op options are like higher level options that are optional for, for user, like uh, I want uh, static NAT, I want port forwarding, and I want the software-defined networking uh, bits to take care of the port forwarding, or I want the virtual router to take care of the port forwarding. This is all a mix and match, and here you can select how you want your network to look like. So from a user side of things, um, actually, yeah, I thought about adding screenshots about how a user would experience software-defined networking. But I already did that in my basic CloudStack introduction because the user just clicks on the create instance or create network, fills in the IP addresses or, the, or name, and clicks up, click submit. <clears throat> There's nothing really special to show here. And that's going back to my initial statement, like we want software-defined networking to be part of the core of CloudStack. So a user doesn't know if we're using software-defined networking. And that's exactly how it should be. We're a cloud orchestration system. So the user should not be bothered with any of the details about any special technical tricks we do in our cloud. So instead of telling you how a user sees uh, software-defined networking, I'm going to run you through how it's actually done in CloudStack when a user clicks on the Submit button. And here we get back to the gurus and the elements. <coughs> so n n one of the most important elements in the uh, architecture design of CloudStack for networking is the guru. The guru has a role when the user creates a network. The user clicks on a network, enters a name, presses submit. The guru then is going to look at the internals of CloudStack and at your configuration. It, for example, it's going to look at which network offering did you select for this, particular, uh, for this particular network, which providers are active in this network. And based on those providers and the isolation method we have set on the physical network, it's going to select a, yeah, a number of actions, and it's actually going to offload a lot of the work to a, a guru that is particularly suited for that type of networking. So in the case we, we have selected the VMware NSX isolation, we will hit the VMware NSX guru. The guru will create a network. It will 
in, the, in our case, send a command to the software-defined networking controller to create the proper networks, and then uh, uh, basically report back that the network is created. When the network is created, actually the software-defined networking controller will take care of making sure that all the hypervisors are properly configured and have the right did bits to actually control it. The interesting part is when we hit the element. I mean, we now have a network. It's probably created on some kind of uh, software-defined networking controller, but nine out of 10 times, it's up to that point, it's just a physical or a, a virtual construct. There's nothing actually provisioned. Stuff will only be provisioned once we hit once we start creating virtual interfaces. When we really have a, a virtual machine that is being spun up on a hypervisor, it wants to have a virtual interface uh, definition, a network card. That's when stuff also starts happening in most of the software-defined networking controllers. Because then we have to say, okay, we have a machine, it has a MAC address, it requests access to a certain piece of networking, and it wants certain networking features, and that's the role of the element. So when a virtual machine plugs a virtual interface card into any kind of network, all the network elements that make up that network are triggered. And yeah, the networking elements triggered depend on the service offering, on the network offering we have selected. So one of the offerings we trigger is the virtual networking offering, or the virtual networking element. The virtual network element to use is defined by the guru already, and the networking element will actually send a command to the networking controller like, hey, any moment now, there is the very real possibility that there will be a virtual machine with this particular MAC address, with this particular IP address, and it requests access to this network. And that's a little bit where the magic actually happens, because that's where we have the, uh, uh, where we have to set up the communication between the hypervisor and the networking bits. Because on one hand, there's the hypervisor creating the actual resources. It's, it's booting a virtual machine. It's configuring a virtual network interface card on the machine. And for example, creating a TAP interface or whatever. And on the other hand, we have a software defined networking controller that needs to know that thinks, there's, thinks that there is going to be a virtual interface card in the near future. The way it happens is that we match unique identifiers. Every cloud uh, uh, system has its way of setting identifiers on this network card. And every single software-defined networking vendor can pick up on those interfaces. And it's actually a sort of not well-documented but universally accepted standard that we use unique identifiers for that. So on one hand, we tell the hypervisor you're going to have a network interface card and it's going to have this unique identifier. And we're going to go to the networking stack and we say, you're going to expect a network interface card and it's going to have this identifier. It's then up to, to the particular implementation of the software-defined networking stack to actually make the connection and make sure that the proper tunnels, flows, and whatever and whatnot are created. And if we're lucky, it will actually work. So in this case, this is uh, just a simple screenshot, but underwater in uh, a lot of things happened. Because we've created a virtual interface, it has been matched based on a unique identifier with the port we've created in our software-defined networking controller. But then the software-defined networking controller got really busy because it needed to create flows because every other virtual machine in the network needs to be able to communicate with this, uh, with this machine. So tunnels need to be created between the switches. And we need to make sure that the tunnels only contain the traffic that we actually want those machines to, uh, to see because it's, it, yeah, it's a separation uh, technique, it's tenant segregation. So we have to take some security measures. So most of, the, most of the time, we're actually not only using tunnels, we're actually using networking flows, which we can really set or limit to particular MAC addresses or particular IP addresses, or even particular IP uh, uh, or TCP settings like port or uh, certain flags. And this is all configured transparently on the network. From the point of cloud stack, we don't even know about this. This is all offloaded to the software of our networking controller. And that's really one of the, yeah, the, the more basic concepts about how we, yeah, how we see it. Get the difficult stuff down to the, uh, to the software of our networking controller and just orchestrate all the bits. That's pretty much all working in CloudStack. If you download CloudStack today, you have this functionality. You probably need a controller, uh, one of the open source controllers like the Open Daylight controller or the built-in GRE controller. 
but this um, we're in, in yeah we're in no way finished at the moment with this uh, with this setup um, we want to go yeah beyond what's currently available or actually beyond what we currently have in cloud stack so actually in the in the near future i would like to stop talking about software defined networking because we fixed software defined networking it's there it's close to being industry uh, industry standard uh, people are solving, for example, the problem that we have with the TCP offloading. Uh, vendors like Broadcom, they're jumping on a bandwagon and they're trying to push VXLAN offloading into the network interface cards. There are smarter interface cards that can do yeah, basically any type of offloading. <coughs> so we're not going to have to talk about software-defined networking for yeah, for a long period of time. Sooner or later, it's going to be a default option. I mean. It's always nice to talk about technology, but if it's if it's default, if it's boring, uh, we can stop talking about it and focus on the interesting points that we have or the challenges that we actually still have. And one of the things that people are going to be talking about is what we now call network function virtualization, and that's going to be that's the next the next biggest thing. Considering that we have fixed the layer two problem, that we can create these segregated uh, networks already in software defined networking. If we have software, and we can have software that runs on, on switches or on any kind of networking device. And we can exactly tell this type of software what to do. There's so much more that we can do than just creating layer two domains. I mean, even though it's all fancy and it sounds very good on the buzzword bingo, um, we're just recreating VLANs in a sense. I mean, okay, they're more flexible, they're virtual, they are massively scalable, but in the end, we still have nothing more fancy than a VLAN. But with network function validation, we can actually go one step beyond. We can actually start thinking about uh, load balancers. We can start thinking about routers. We can start thinking about firewalls. I mean, one of the downsides of any typical type of router is that you have your big multi-scalable data center, which is stretched over God knows how many locations. But every time a packet needs to go to another network, there's a single device somewhere in the network that deals with that particular packet. Um, but in a cloud type of network, it might very well be that the intended destination of that packet is the virtual machine right next to the one that you're sending the packet from. But still, because that's the way we define routing, it's gonna go to a central router and it's gonna come back. Making it, yeah, using a lot of resources in the data center that it shouldn't have. So if we have a software-defined networking and we know exactly what type of packets or what type of network or how it looks like, and we have a central overview of the network, we can actually start put, uh, pushing more intelligent decisions down the, down the stack. So one of the things we can do is distribute the routing. If I know that the virtual machine with that particular IP address is running right next to me and I have a virtual definition of how my routing table should look like, I don't need to send that particular packet to some central hub anymore. I can just send it to the VM that's running right next to me on the same hypervisor because I know it's there and I can just push the flow and make sure it gets there. And the same goes for the advanced functions, firewalling and load balancing. If I know that this packet is gonna be load balanced over machine A and machine B, I can send it directly to machine A and B, maybe do some translations, but I don't have to send it to a central device and actually have it processed there. Um, <coughs> and there's, yeah, there's more things we can do with this, uh, with this technology. Uh, also part of the network function uh, uh, virtualization is that we can integrate more with people who are now thinking about automating their firewalls. I mean, it used to be that, for example, a firewall was really a physical device. You had to buy it. And then there was a checkpoint, which you can actually, you could buy it as a piece of software, you can install it on a machine. If those machines are more capable of dealing with APIs, like for example F5, and they can run on a virtual machine, suddenly we have the option of actually, yeah, auto, auto scaling them. We can uh, build them on demand and we can control them using an API. Well, we have CloudStack, which is pretty well suited to actually boot virtual machines when you need them. So we can start integrating those network functions, even though they are still like uh, central points where we have to push the traffic through, but at least we can automate the process. We can create firewalls on demand using their virtual images. We can control them using an API to tell them exactly what we need them to do. It means that we can better integrate them in the whole orchestration system. Uh, and yeah, one of the important parts there is that by integrating them, we take the entire configuration and all the settings, we take them into a single orchestration platform. And that's back where we started, where we, what we wanted to do with CloudStack is be an orchestration platform for everything. 
one of the other uh, key things that we want to put a lot more effort in is the on-ramp, off-ramp traffic. Um, for example, with the VMware NSX interface, we do have the gateway functionality, but unfortunately at the moment it's not possible to configure that particular type of gateway using CloudStack. Uh, you have to go outside CloudStack, use the API directly and configure an off-ramp. What we want to do in CloudStack is make sure that we have this option. That, and that option is not only a, a technical option in the sense that we can create bridges to a, a physical network, but actually allowing us to have more advanced options in CloudStack, for example, for cloud bursting. Now, you have an existing network and it hosts a couple of web servers, and suddenly you know that on the, uh, in the December months, people are gonna hit your web shop a lot more often, so you want some additional capacity. You can do all kinds of tricks by uh, rerouting capacity to other servers. But one of the things that a lot of people seem to do now is just yeah, extend that particular network into the cloud and use the cloud functionality to quickly create an additional number of virtual machines. So you can have your base capacity on a regular VLAN in your regular data center and use your cloud or one of the cloud offerings where you have access to, to spin up additional capacity without having to change your network layout. You can even stretch a network between different locations or different geographical areas. And the on-ramp, uh, uh, the same. You have cloud infrastructures that you want to have access from uh, an office network, or you want to have it access from yeah, the single remaining mainframe in your data center. So you want also you want, you want to take on that kind of orchestration into CloudStack. So one of the reasons we are now focusing on yeah, yeah, getting some on-ramp, off-ramp uh, configurations in. <coughs> and the last part for the networking guys who've been, who've been paying attention is that we have been saying we're gonna automate the network, we're gonna orchestrate the network, and we're gonna create virtual networks. And a lot of the current software-defined networking vendors, they sort of forgot about the real network. I mean, I can talk for hours about virtual networking and how we can solve all kinds of complex provisioning problems, but at the end of the day, there is a physical network in the data center. There is a cable that will send your packet from A to B. And for CloudStack, I think it's important that we not only focus on, uh, on the virtual networking on the client side, but also on the data center side. I mean, we do capacity management on hypervisors. We do capacity management on storage. Shouldn't we do capacity management on the network? And I'm thinking about how do, how do we measure if particular inter-data center links are getting overloaded, or how do we measure if particular uh, uh, connections between switches are starting to get overloaded? Or how do we measure when a certain hypervisor hosts so many high traffic uh, VM instances that its uh, internal network card can't keep up? So that's things that we currently don't have yet. We focus completely on making sure that we have, from an end user perspective, a fully functional software defined networking stack. But yeah, since we've pretty much uh, done that already, the next focus is gonna be on how do we deal with the actual third, uh, yeah, the actual physical networks inside, uh, inside CloudStack. Yeah, and there's way more. I mean, this technology is, is progressing, so I'm, uh, I'm always looking for, uh, for new ideas. And that's actually all there is to software-defined networking in Apache CloudStack. I hope you enjoyed this, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. So the question is, can we use the virtual router in CloudStack to route traffic for physical servers? Um, at the moment, the virtual router is pretty much there to handle traffic from what we call the internal, the isolated networks, and route it to outside infrastructures. Uh, it can do uh, static NAT, et cetera, and port forwarding. So in a sense, yes, you can. Um, so you can, yeah, you can use it to connect to outside services, usually, usually what we call the public, uh, the public internet. But if you look at it from an on-ramp, off-ramp uh, type of perspective, it's currently not possible. The only exception is the virtual private cloud. There we have an additional option, which is called a private gateway. And with a private gateway, you can actually say we have uh, in-cloud networks, we have public internet, but we also have an internal network. And with the private gateway, you can actually, you, you do connect uh, existing resources to your uh, uh, virtual router. Is it open to each virtual switch network deployed on every single hypervisor? 
So the question is, does the open feed switch have to be deployed on every hypervisor? Um, yes. It has to be pre-deployed. And actually, most cloud vendors at the moment, uh, or most hypervisors, actually include it. For example, the Xen Server hypervisor has a, an existing installation of OpenV switch already there. Um, I've heard that some of the uh, Linux distributions are, are going to switch to OpenV switch uh, for standard. So usually, the, the initial installation of OpenV switch is taken care of by, uh, uh, by the hypervisor. And then we just have to provision uh, uh, it or set certain settings so we can access it uh, remotely. But in cases where you run another type of, hyper, of hypervisor, for example, K KVM hypervisor that's using the Linux bridge module, you would actually have to switch yourself to open v switch before you can actually enable any of these uh, features. So the question is, if I foresee any changes to current switches uh, with the move to software-defined networking? <coughs> um, yes, I see a lot of changes. And I think the changes are pretty much similar to a lot of the changes we've seen in physical hardware, where if we move complexity over to software and we move complexity to software-defined networking controllers, the switches that we, that we need in our data center are going to be selected on different, uh, uh, different reasons. I no longer need to select a switch based on the number of VLANs I want to support. I no longer need to uh, uh, buy a switch on the basis of which type of advanced functions it can support. I can now select a switch ba based on uh, the real bare bones functionality that I want from the switch and leave all the more interesting stuff to the software defined networking controller. So I'm, uh, I'm personally now selecting switches on uh, things like uh, port forwarding speed, uh, link aggregation efficiency, Etc. So I'm, I'm looking at a completely different set of requirements. And based on those different set of requirements, I'm going to select new switches. So it's going to be a scramble for the traditional switch vendors to actually keep up and yeah, provide their services. For example, uh, if you look at, uh, for some cum cumulus or the, uh, the upcoming white label switches, I mean, it's very easy to create a very simple switch fabric that is controllable using an open, uh, uh, using a networking controller. Uh, you don't need uh, 60 years of experience and a very expensive office to be able to do it. Any other questions? Go ahead. Um, so the question is about uh, how we do firewalls, um, if we're still using the IP tables type of system, or are, do, are we actually using some more advanced flow-based methods? Um, that's a really good question. And the reason it's a particularly good question is that one of the d problems we have with dealing with firewalls in software-defined networking is the fact that they contain state. And the moment something contains state, and that not only goes for networking, but it goes for almost any type of software, the moment we contain state, we have to have a single point where we aggregate that state and use it. So the difficulty with firewalls and software-defined networking is how do we deal with the state? So a lot of the software-defined networking uh, stuff we have can use flow-based security, but it usually means that we have a stateless firewall. So we're just going to tell you, you can access this IP address or you can't. You can access this port or you can't. But it, they don't allow for a really reflexive system. So that's the reason a lot of them are also using IP tables in addition to this. <coughs> because they have the actual uh, flexibility in the mixes and matching. But that means that we still have to have a central point where we have the actual rules. Uh, so we can actually yeah, deal with tenant traffic and have s stateful uh, firewalls. So it, it's one of the problems that still need to be solved, how we maintain distributed state of firewalls uh, throughout the software defined networking network. Is there any motivation to, hard to offload it to, uh, to hardware? Um, yes, there's always uh, a motivation to do so. And the motivation is uh, efficiency and speed. 
anything done in, in software, even though I've just been t telling you about software-defined networking for an hour. But stuff done in software could potentially be slower. It allows you m more flexibility. But if you, once you can configure that flexibility, that's why we still like physical switches with a data plane, because physical switches use ASICs, and they are far more capable of handling network traffic at great speed. So actually, I'm, I'm not telling anybody that everything is going to be moving to software. Actually, I see a lot of stuff moving to hardware again, but controllable by software. So the software should control the stuff, should tell it what to do, but the hardware should actually do it, because, yeah, as we all know, I think silicon is still pretty much handy to do stuff really fast. Any other questions? No? Okay, thank you for your attention.